Salam Namaste, Satsyakal, and welcome to yet another episode of What's Your Story by Madhvi. And I'm Madhvi, the host of the evening. Yes, off it, I've been talking about, you know, bringing more celebrities and dignitaries onto my show uh, with different segments. And today we have um, a very prominent world cinema figure, or rather a producer, a director, a writer, Mr. Robert Pishovic. Am I right, sir? Welcome to my show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I hope I pronounced it right. It's close. Okay. So coming back to sir, it's, he's a Siberian Canadian writer, producer, director, and founder of the famous Pensary Film Studios in Toronto. And also festival director at Penn Dance Film Festival. Mm -hmm. And he grew up in Asia and Europe before immigrating to USA with his parents. He studied philosophy and statistics and went to University of Toronto and graduated in 2011. So thank you, sir. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation and coming on to my show. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you. How are you feeling today? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. You're good. Okay. So... Where should I start from? I know you are, uh, first of all, so busy with your festival, which is, you know, the Penn Dance Festival, which is upcoming. Is it online or you're doing it, uh, I mean, just a physical thing? Um, yeah, the COVID situation here in Toronto is uh, getting, you know, it's, we were hoping that we'd be able to do some portion of it online, but we're not going to be able to this year. So we thought about it. We thought about going to another city. We thought about going to another country, you know, like uh -huh. maybe live streaming it here, doing it in another country. But mm -hmm. in the end, it was like, you know what, let's embrace this. You know, this is a chance to connect with new people. Um, every year we have a handful of directors who come to our festival and a handful that don't. This year, we really have a chance to have all of them at our festival online so there's no that's barriers right, because right. We're, we're a world film festival. So we select films from everywhere in the world. And sometimes it's very difficult for a filmmaker to come from China or to come from Europe uh, for, you know, for us. So yeah, it's, it's going to be exciting. It's going to be cool. Uh, we've seen a lot of other film festivals do it really well and do it very poorly. So we've learned a lot of lessons because we were the last North American film festival to happen live. Like February 20th to 23rd was our last festival. And then after that, like I think two weeks later, the world was shut down. So, so yeah. South by Southwest canceled, Con canceled, and so and so so forth. And it's been hybrid or virtual festivals since. So uh, we've had a year to watch other people do this. We've seen right. it, you know, like so. We've done it. We've seen it done well. And I'm a filmmaker. I've had my films at virtual film festivals quite a few. I've liked certain experiences, have not liked certain experiences. So using all of that, we're gonna put something together for our filmmakers <clears throat> that we select that's going to give the maximum value back to them. And mm -hmm. we're gonna do our best, yeah. Absolutely. So what's the selection criteria that you guys follow and it's different from others? And how do you, you know, I mean, how can you say that, yeah, Penn Dance Festival is different from others? Um, well, I mean, for starters, we we don't we don't have we, we have a motto story over everything, which is mm -hmm. kind of funny because it seems like it's the, you know we're on your story uh, show and it's a story, so yeah, and that basically means you know again rooting back to my own experiences as a filmmaker, I've always kind of uh, disengaged from the politics of film festivals. I don't like the politics, and frankly, I don't like politics in general, and so. I want, I started with this philosophy that if I'm ever face to face with a filmmaker that we selected or we didn't select, I will never have to lie about whether, the, why they got in or why they didn't get in, right? Because you might select a film because Brad Pitt is in it, right? Mm -hmm. But you will never tell the filmmaker, we selected your film because Brad Pitt was in it. You will tell them it's a good film, it's a good film. So yeah. be, being able to be honest or versus you know, maybe there's a film that didn't get in because it didn't have a big celebrity. 
And you're not going to tell that film, oh, you didn't get in because you ha- you didn't have a big celebrity. You will never say that in person. And so my question is, if you can't say it, why do it, right? So story of everything means I watch your film. We watch your film as a team. If it's a good story, it moves us. It's technically proficient. You know, we're not talking like sound levels are all over the place. Colors, you know, very uneven. Mm-hmm. But it's a good story. We engage with it. We think our audience will like it. We'll program it. So whether we know you, don't know you, maybe we know you and we program you two years in a row and third year you submit a film and we love you. We love being around you, but your film isn't good. It's not getting in. So that type of, you know, it's very rare among film festivals. Transparency, yeah. A, transparency, B, no bullshit approach, you know? So it's like, okay, like, and and I get why this is a bad thing. I get it, right? Because filmmakers... On the highest level. What do you mean by it, bad thing? What do you mean the bad thing? You get it, the bad well, thing. Consider the following, right? So if you're a prominent filmmaker, right? And you spend two, three years. Um, film festivals are always competing. On the highest right. level, uh, mm-hmm. you're always competing for films. So we, for instance, we program after Sundance in, in Canada here, right? So yes. our competition is with... I mean, I hate the word competition. It's competition is for, you know, horses. But in a sense, we are competing. It's for kind certain- of a looked, looked uh, closely towards it, you know? Yeah, like, I mean, obviously we want certain films. And it's it's happened before where we'll select a film, right? In November or December, we really like it. We love it. We're happy with it. With it. And then in November or December, Sundance selects it and we lose it right? Because they got to go there and then they don't want to come here, whatever. Um, so that's the kind of, you know, the trade-off. A lot of films that are Canadian made, obviously we love Canadian films. We're a Canadian film festival. A lot of films in Canada are going to go to TIFF first. They want to go to TIFF. They want to go to Calgary. They want to go to Fantasia. There are a lot of really good film festivals in, in Canada. And so in a way, we're also competing with them, right? Because for a film that comes to Sundance, right? they can tour the whole world and then come back to TIFF, right? They can right. do all the festival stops. But our view is, you know, Sundance and TIFF are separated by nine months. And mm-hmm. we are all separated with Sundance by a few days. So why mm-hmm. not skip the line, take the nine months? And it's a tough proposition, you know, telling a filmmaker, forget about TIFF, come to Pendance for your film. Uh, but a lot of filmmakers have done this already. You know, they, they love the already? idea. Yeah, like we've had films that are starting because I always uh, you read my article and I was talking about festival paths. So one of the one of the festival paths that a few filmmakers have taken already, which is a really cool festival path in my opinion, is Sundance, Rotterdam, Toronto, uh, Pendance, right? Pendance. Knock out your you know your probably your world premiere at Sundance. Knock out your you know uh, European premiere with uh, with Rotterdam, and then come knock out your Canadian premiere with Pendance. So that way you can pretty much nail three festivals in two weeks. And it's a two great, weeks. it's a great starting point. But obviously as a young film festival, we are constantly behind the, behind the wheel. Can we offer the same uh, press that, you know, the big film festivals can? No, we can't. We don't have a market. There's a lot of things we don't have. So we focus on what we do have, which is an audience. We have, you know, uh, we have a strong marketing department. So we get your film out there and, you know, we'll, we'll do our best to just give you a nice human experience. No matter who's come to Pendance, they're always raving about it. Even two years later, three years later, I felt so warm. I felt so welcomed. Those are important festival experiences too. So yeah, 10 years down the line, maybe we'll have a market. Maybe we'll have the, the biggest press list in, in the world. Maybe all yes. of that will happen. But for now, we don't. So what do we do? We focus on filmmaker experience, filmmaker interaction. We make sure that the people who come to our festival meet people at the festival that they can work with, that they can collaborate with, that they can be friends with, they can bounce ideas off of. So many times a film will come to Pendance in maybe 2019, 2020, and the filmmaker will say, yeah, this film started because we had a conversation at the Brooklyn Film Festival in 2015 or Tallgrass in 2016 or something like that. And it'll be That's like... That's the kind of memories you want to, you know, leave your audience with, you know, looking That's exactly for it. it. But it's also, you know, the film festivals can be artist hubs, right? So mm-hmm. as a filmmaker myself, if I get selected to 
you know, Cannes Film Festival or Cine Foundation or something like that, who am I meeting at this film festival? I'm probably going to meet a lot of people who are probably a lot better at making films than I am. And so I'm going to learn a lot. I'm going to go to go to a lot of panels. I'm going to go to a lot of workshops. So, you know, film festivals like Cannes, uh, TIFF, Sundance, they're, they're mega festivals. You get everything there, right? Everything you get a market, there. you get press, you get publicity, you get reputation, you get everything, right? But for smaller film festivals and younger film festivals, you have to do something well. Like you have to, you have to bring out an audience because that's important. You know, if, if a filmmaker comes to your festival, and there's only three people in the audience. What's that? That's not a very meaningful experience in my opinion. So if you have 200 people in front of the audience, maybe you're happy because now 200 people gave you live feedback on your film. Maybe they're clapping, maybe they're crying, maybe they're, you know, laughing and now you can feel it, right? You get to do the mm -hmm. Q&A after, which gives you preparation for bigger film festivals. When you go and stand in front of 600 people at the Egyptian at Sundance, now you have some preparation uh, for that later down. And also they can be artist hubs, as I said, you know, so they can be a place for like-minded, intelligent, talented people with strong artistic vision to connect and inspire each other. That's also important. So that's what Pendance has been to date. Obviously, you know, we have to move forward as a festival so that we can develop a marketplace so that films can be sold and bought here. Every year we try, we try to get agents and distributors to come out. We're very, very ambitious. Um, mm -hmm. But, but you know, what about hard. the concept concept of it? I mean, uh, you were into philosophy and uh, when did you decide to you know, write your first story or a script for that sake? And when did you develop this interest that, yeah, uh, you know, I have to go towards this? Um, so I was always writing short stories back in high school. Mm -hmm. Even even actually, mm -hmm. I remember um, in grade three, mm -hmm. third grade here, I was... Yeah eight years old nine years old in new york yes and then okay. i'd written a story about a bully beating up this kid it was actually a very personal story because i was being beat up at the time by some big bully you can share it you can share yeah it. And, and, and i'd written a few words in it the, the line was and he could feel him swirling uh, he could feel his breath swirling down his back and the and the teacher immediately said this is plagiarized that this, this cannot have been written by someone your age. It's impossible. Yes. And in yes. fact, this would happen over and over in grade three, grade four, grade five, several times where I would write something really ambitious or really, you know, ahead of my age. And someone would say, impossible that you could have written this. And then I forgot about it for a long time. I was very maths oriented. Like I'd always, uh, I'd always been good at math. I'd always been told like, do math, math science, math science, or you're not going to get a job. So I kind of gave up on the writing thing for a while. And I was, was more focused on music and painting and doing, uh, you know, all that stuff. And then suddenly in grade 12, I, I, I was late signing up for my courses. And there was only one course available. And it was creative writing. <laughs> and I was like, oh, shit, like, how am I going to do this? And the teacher in that creative writing class was my grade 11 English teacher, Mrs. Brown. And no. she had hated me the previous year. She did not like me. I thought she hated my guts. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm screwed. So I show up in her class and she looks at me and she's like, you do know this is a really hard class, right? And I was like, um, yeah, I know. And then yeah. she it was really weird and then I, I wrote this very sloppy first story in that class it was some assignment and she kind of ripped it in front of the whole class like this is how you don't write like it's sloppy it's turned in late this shows me that you don't care and I and I'd skipped her class the previous year and she'd yelled at me for that too like she totally railed me out right mm -hmm. I I'd skipped her class I was skipping classes a lot so I'd gone into my Spanish class that day and she came to my class and she's like, I want you out of my class. I don't want you in my class anymore. Seriously? She really, really did out not of my like class. Me. Yeah. And I made it a point at that point that this woman is going to take me seriously. I'm going to do something and shock her. So the next day I started turning right. in my essays perfectly. Like I'd, I'd write stories with so much passion. I would check them 500 times. I would do it. So I would turn everything in crisply. And now she was like, okay, this kid's getting better. Like, what's he doing? Yeah, he and can do honestly, it. Honestly, 
it just sparked a love interest. I ended up with 98% or 97% in that class that year. It was like the wow. high, it, was, it was the second highest mark ever in that class. And mm -hmm. honestly, we became really good friends, the teacher and I, over that. This oh, is this, this is uh, wonderful to hear. This is wonderful. Yeah, this is. She, she, uh, you know, I, I met I met up with her even two years ago. Like we're still talking. We still talk. Like she's she's amazing, and she really changed my life. To be honest, she told me that she taught me that creative writing was a passion for me and that I could do it. And then I honestly I forgot about it for another seven eight years. I just didn't write much of anything, and then I I had an accident where oh. you know, I went into hedge funds, I went into finance, I, I worked all sorts of jobs for money. And then I had an accident where one night, um, one, one morning, a vase, 20 pound vase fell on my head. I don't know if you can see the scar, it's now faded, but um, 39 stitches, I thought I was gonna die. And I'm in the ambulance and I've been thinking about, I wanna do something more meaningful in my life. I wanna do something more meaningful in my life. And in that ambulance, I'm like, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Like, I'm bleeding out so much. I've been bleeding for an hour. It's from my head. There's no way I'm going to live. I don't have parents. Who's going to take care of this? I was so panicked inside. And the woman's like, it's okay. You're going to be fine, the paramedic. And I was like, in the hospital, they patched me up. They stitched me up. And in that moment, I was like, I can't do this anymore. I have to do something meaningful with my life. Like, when I die, if I die someday... I cannot think that all I devoted my life to was, oh, he made some money. It has to be something. So I made it a point there to, to start giving back. You know, I started doing lectures at high schools about perseverance and getting over hard situations because I had a tough situation growing up. Life we taught you so much. Life itself yeah. taught you so much. Absolutely. And yeah, so I, I wrote my first script. It was a feature script. I auctioned it off. Mm -hmm. And I, didn't, I wasn't happy with the offers. They wanted to change everything. And then I was like, let me just buy a camera and do it myself. So I started there and now I've, read, I've written, unofficially I've written like close to 35, 40 scripts, but um, wow. officially I've written 14, 14 scripts, um, 13 of which that have been produced. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's five years of my life, six years of my life. So it's been fun. It's been fun. So what about, I, I've seen uh, your movie, a uh, short movie, Penny. It's, mm -hmm. it's just amazing. And um, so what is this thumb rule about when you say limit your dialogue theory? What do you mean by that? Just wanted, was very curious to know about it. Limiting your dialogue? Yeah. Um, okay, well, first of all, I think dialogue is really hard to write writing like a lot of people can write stories but when mm -hmm. it comes to making people sound real it's very difficult also dialogue is very hard to perform right the more dialogue you have the more it, and third it's very hard to shoot right interestingly mm -hmm. there are very few directors maybe david fincher can do it you know uh mm -hmm. steven spielberg these top end directors they can shoot dialogue very compellingly but truthfully, the less dialogue you have, in my opinion, the better. And it should be, you know, this old theory of film is show, don't tell. So when you're working with newer filmmakers, you're usually working with newer actors, or I don't want to say lesser actors, but less talented than Leonardo DiCaprio. Let's put it that way. And you're asking them to remember these very, very long lines. Yes. And they're in their head and they're thinking, what's that word that goes after that word? What's that word? And they're not acting they're remembering. And the other problem is the other person is now thinking, they said that, what's my line? So they're trying to remember their line and they're not acting. You stop talking so much, you remove some of the obstacles for these actors to be able to act. So in my short film, Stain, there's almost no dialogue. There's literally like, I think six lines of dialogue, seven lines of dialogue in that whole film. Everyone mm -hmm. says, the acting is so great. Tara's so great. Carla's so great. Are they great actors? Sure. They're really good actors. But 90% of that is created by the fact that you've removed all of the what's my line, what's my line crap, and you've asked them to just engage with the moment. You've asked them to just engage with that. And again, when I work with Leonardo DiCaprio, I promise I'll write more lines. Tons of lines. <laughs> 
I would never do what they did to him in The Revenant and ask him to just roll around. Yeah. In this world. Yeah. Like, that was stupid. But, that was like, not fair. Yeah. But, you know, you get Tom Hardy, you get, you know, these really great actors, guests, give them lines, give them tons of lines. They're really good at it, right? Mm-hmm. Most actors are not good at it. Most screenwriters are terrible at writing lines, like writing dialogue. So it's like, it's double entendre. It's a double sword, a double edged sword because, A, you're bad at writing lines, they're bad at performing lines you're bad at shooting lines so by the end of the film the parts where they're talking are so bad you know what i mean so yeah, yeah that's that's my theory behind limiting dialogue for sure and uh, your slogan says on your t-shirt that that says uh, story over everything mm-hmm. what does that mean is there a, you mean to say that the story over every act or every life I think what I mean by that, it's, it's funny because initially it started as what I explained earlier, that the story on your, in your film is more important than your budget, your actors, your star, celebrity, status, all that stuff. I don't care about that. Just give me the story. Later, as I started to delve more into psychology and neuroscience, it got me thinking about how we frame our own story in our head is literally our existence in life. If I mm-hmm. always frame myself as a victim, if I always frame myself as the unlucky chap, then that's going to be my life. My yes. story becomes my life. If I frame myself as somebody who will persevere and who will aspire to be better every day, if that's my story, I'm someone who does this. You know, what are you asking someone when you ask them, you know, tell me about yourself? You're really asking in other words, what's your story? So when some people tell you is, you know, my husband left me. I have such a sad life. My, you know, my, my boss hates my life. You know, my boss is, you know, I'm underpaid. I've been at the same job for 20 years. That's their, that's their story, right? And their story is dictating their life. It's not the other way around. Most people think, oh, my story is a reflection of my life. I'm like, no, your life is a reflection of your story, right? The other person will be like, you know, I had a divorce and it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> you know, um, I, I don't like my job, so I'm actively looking for a better one, but I'm learning a lot along the way about why I don't want to do this. And it's just like reframing. It's reframing. So framing a story, right? Like, I mean, if I, you know, think about it this way, Penny, you know, you watch Penny, you like Penny. Um, fine. Imagine I just pointed the camera at the ground the whole time. Would you still like the movie? No, because I'm no. focusing something else so whatever you focus on in life expands and whatever you don't focus on does not so so you want to focus on opportunities that are available to you there are millions you are not looking for them you're not going to find them so that's really what the story over everything means it's like you can change your entire life by changing how you tell your story to yourself right Right. let's let's go back to your story um when you were a small kid and uh how were you at the school life? I mean, you sh- sure you shared that you were in English, you were a naughty one, and you know, you, apart from that, what other things and what friends, you know, chemistry you had shared with them? Would you like to share some story if you remember? I remember everything. This is a curse and a blessing. Like, I remember everything, everything. Like, I remember the house we lived in when I was three, like, right. photographic right? Like people tell me like, oh, you can't. And then I, I drew, I drew out the whole thing. And then my mom looked at a picture and she was like, oh my God, it's exactly, he knew where the couch was. He knew the color, everything. So I remember everything from when I was a kid pretty well. Um, okay. I was very shy, extremely, shy? Shy, extremely okay. shy. Um, okay. Very shy. I was very insecure. I, I had a lot of acne growing up, grade six, grade seven. I hit puberty faster than anyone. So I had a mustache and hair on my leg. I have less hair on my leg today than I did when I was in grade seven. I don't understand what the hell was, was going on. Did I, really, I was a gorilla okay. and I became very clean. I don't know. It was very weird. So it was very awkward. I mean, I think all kids go through this awkward stage where they don't know where they fit in. Um, and also I think part of, you know, being new all the time was weird right because we moved around a lot like we moved around from country to country we moved around from school to school state to state constantly mm-hmm. moving 
And every time it was so weird, like every time I'd go to a new school, I would throw up the day before, like the morning of, like my mom would stop giving me breakfast at one point. She's like, he's just going to throw up because he's so nervous. And that anxious, mm -hmm. anxious feeling was always there of, will I get laughed at? Will the kids like me? Will I make friends? Will I be alone? You know, this is scary. And also I was such a mommy's boy, like growing up, I was just like, you know, people would be like, oh, Robert, come here. And I would just go right behind my mom's leg. Like, just like hide, protect me, yeah. you know? Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, so I was like that. And honestly, I didn't break out of my shell really until about grade seven. But as a kid, I was very shy. But after that, I became very bold. Um, after my, my, my dad passed away when I was in grade six, grade seven, Sorry, about 12, 13. And uh, I think after that, I just, I became a very different person for a while. I started doing very different things. I was very risk uh, takey. I, I had new friends. I got really into basketball. Um, yeah, so it just, I, I felt like a, a big change. So I've changed very, very much, very many times in my life. Like three, four years, five years maximum. And then a new me is born. And that new me has very different focus, different philosophy, different ideas, different thoughts. Some people think that's bad. Some people think, you know, you, if you believe in something, you should stick to it. But I'm more of the, if you have new information, you should utilize it, right? If I'm thinking something when I'm 21 and by 22, 23, somebody gives me ideas on what to think better. You know, I, I read new books. I, I see new people. I talk to other people. Then why shouldn't I change? everyone should change all the time people should always evolve so yeah. so yeah I went from very shy to very very you know talkative like you couldn't shut me up like by the time I was 17 yeah 16, I can see that now yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> by, by 16 it was like you put me mm -hmm. like I remember at 16 <clears throat> I was at a I was at a 16 or 17 I was 17 and there was a it was in New York a lot of my family's in New York and so there was a there was a fundraiser with Hillary Clinton, right? Mm -hmm. And quite a few politicians, you know, notable politicians from New York area, no, whatever. No, no. And mm -hmm. a friend of a friend had invited me to be her plus one to that event because her husband couldn't make it. And she was like, he's such a bright and precocious kid. Let me bring him, you know, it'll be cool for him. And I, mm -hmm. I guess I was expected to just sit there and eat my dinner and shut up, but I would not. So I'm telling these like career <gasps> politicians who are in their 50s and 60s that they need to focus on climate change. They need to be more green. And I'm just talking and talking. You're talking and talking and, talking and, and telling them yeah. all the things that you yeah, know. everything that they're doing wrong. Also, they're the things that you don't know. <laughs> totally. I was so stupid. But you know, funny, I was right. I was, I was totally right about a lot of things, you know, but it was by accident. I didn't know what I was talking about. Obviously, 17 years old, what the hell do I know, you know? But I, I was not afraid to say it, which is good. I think it's a good quality, especially if you can correct yourself later. So yeah, so I remember I remember very clearly and I was just like, wow, I'm out talking everyone. <laughs> They're all like big politicians, senators, state senators, whatever. They do not want to hear this from me. But a few of them actually were like, you know what? You might have a leadership quality to you somewhere yes. down the line you know yeah. like this is cool yeah that you're bold enough that you're driven enough you're confident enough to say so much and that's funny because you know you contrast that to when I was in grade three and I didn't even want to put my hand up in class ever I was like oh my god what what if please don't please don't pick on me you know please don't please I don't think call. to some extent I was also like that to grade three so I was okay. like yeah same same and, and, and same switch. same yeah, and okay. then it was a great switch at my class fourth. Yeah. So um, let me show you something. Sure. If you allow me to. Absolutely. Thank you.
So that's it. Cool. Very nostalgic. Yes. Oh, yes. I remember you started this festival with your co-founder. Mm -hmm. Would you like to share something about it? Um, yeah. Uh, Angelica and I have been friends for a really, really long time, and we're still friends. Uh, mm -hmm. We met in 2008. Uh, I think she's a really lovely person. Um, she's always been a very inspirational person to me. Um, I think the rarest, you know, my grandmother once told me a very strange thing. She asked me when I was in grade five, Robert, how many friends do you have? Tell me about your friends. I was like, which friends? She's like, well, how many friends do you have? I was like, oh, I have tons of friends, tons of friends. And she's like, no, you don't have tons of friends. I was like, how do you know? She's like, no, you have three friends. Who are your three friends? And I was kind of confused. And then we started, you know, she started explaining to me what a friend was. And I realized, okay, she's right. I, I don't even have three friends. And she said that a friend was somebody that you could talk to about anything, that you never had to guess whether they were telling you the truth, yeah. right? And whether they made you feel bad or feel good, they did it for you. They're just there, yeah, there for you. And that, you know, has been a very rare thing to find that somebody could mm -hmm. look at your work, your script, your, your idea, your behavior, and honestly tell you without any agenda, this is wrong or this is right. This is good or this is bad. I support this, I don't support this. And that there was never any love lost in the process. That there was never an idea of when will this person not support me? When will this person not care about me anymore? That it was just forever. And so there are some people like that, I think, if you're lucky enough in life to meet a few of those people, it's very, very fortunate for you. And so, you know, I've had a few of those people in my life, luckily. You know, uh, my friend Christina was, was like that as well. My friend Cleve is like that as well, where no matter how much time passes in the friendship, 15 years, uh, I think Christina and I have known each other, had known each other. She passed away this past year. She was 33. She had leukemia. Um, we'd known each other since 2006. Cleve and I had known each other since 2002. Angelica and I had known each other since 2008. And those are the three people that I was just like, there's never lying here. There's never manipulation. So it felt right to start a film festival, to start a film studio with this type of person that you never have to second guess. You always trust. That's important. And it also helps that she's really smart. She's extremely smart. She's very, she's very perceptive. She reads situations really well. She's a very talented composer. Um, so yeah, it was really, really cool. And I, I don't think I could have, I, I, I wouldn't have had the courage to do this without her. So it's important. And, and what happens, like, would you like to share that uh, when you're directing or you are having an actor who is, uh, you know, in, experience much more than you or maybe in age so how do you take their feedbacks i mean if they say no let's do this way let's do it that way and they're much more experienced than what you are how do you take them so all experience is not equal right, right. let's 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 be real right. <laughs> like you know you could you could have like for instance like I, the way I think about this is is exactly the way I receive it, is the same way I give it. So maybe, maybe I've been directing a film festival for four years, or maybe I've been directing films for six years, and my mm -hmm. production assistant has never been on a film set before, right? Mm -hmm. Let's just pretend. Right. But let's say my production assistant says, I don't, just by the way, Robert, I think you should do it this way. Should I not listen to this person because I have more years and they have less years? I always listen. I always hear the, I always hear it. So I, I use the same thing with my actors. Sometimes the actors that I'm working with are on their second or third film. Sometimes they're on their 20th film, 50th film. It doesn't matter. I will listen to you regardless of where you are in your career. And if you have a point, I'm going to address it. I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not an insecure director, which I think is important. I'm not thinking to myself, I wrote it this way, I want it this way, and if I accept your feedback, then people will think I'm weak. 
I don't care if people think I'm weak. I'm going to do the right thing for the film. And if you have a better idea than me, I'm going to take it. And if you have a worse idea than me, I'm going to stick with my guns until you show me why your idea is better, right? If you don't think a line works because you don't want to say it that way, then let's see it. Let's, let's see what you want to do. And if I don't like the way you're doing it, then you're going to have to trust that I'm right. Okay. You know, that's just as simple as it is. Um, but I don't believe in this concept of like, you know, I've been doing this for 15 years. You've been doing it for three years. So I'm right by default. That's stupid. Yeah. So you, you're pretty cool about accepting whatever is right. And uh, I tell every actor the same thing. If you give me a line that's better than the line I wrote, I still get the writing credit. So I don't care. <laughs> Okay, we're not going to put Robert wrote the script, but this line is by this person. I still get the credit. So if you come up with a better line than I wrote, thank you. I'm happy to work with you. If you can do that five, 10 times, happy to hear it. Very nice. Let me have a rapid fire round with you. Let's know more about you. Sure. Sure. <laughs> okay. So what's your favorite color? Blue. Your yummy food. Burger or a wrap? Wrap. I, I'm sure you have uh, traveled to India. So uh, do you know anything about Indian cuisine? And if yes, then would you love to eat? I know so much about Indian cuisine. It will blow your mind. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. So what is that Indian cuisine uh, which you, you love to eat? No glory or... I, mean, uh, I like I like two distinct. So uh, I told you last conversation that we had with the uh, with the other thing that I had been to Hyderabad. So I I'd had Hyderabadi biryani, which was really yeah. awesome. Yeah. Um, I often I really like Punjabi food. So a lot of. What do you like in Punjabi food? Rajma chawal, kadhi chawal, you love, or the parathas. I like I'll Rajma Chawal. I like uh, I like paratas. Oh I like. Oh my um, god! I can't believe it. Right. So okay. uh, I like I like uh, dal makhni, chicken makhni, like uh, you know um, what what else? Um, uh, hold on, uh, sag paneer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, non of course, uh, chicken tandoori, everything. So I'm, I'm really the sunny types, huh? Really, yeah. yeah. And, and, and you'll get a kick out of this. Every week, I buy kurkure. Here. Excuse me. Yeah. Not true. It's the kurkure, very true. Kurkure? Yeah. The, the orange packet. The kurkure, orange the, packet of corn, corn kurkure? Okay, okay. So you must be understanding Hindi well too. Very well. Aapko Hindi aati hai. Yes. <laughs> yes, okay. Uh, okay, fine. So, hot coffee or a beer? Hot coffee. Seriously? Yep. Okay. Jeans or shorts? Okay. Shorts. I wear shorts even in the winter over here. Uh huh. Okay. Jogging or gym? Gym. Urban living style or a very country type of living style? Urban. All time favorite movie? Four months, three weeks, two days. <clears throat> Why? Um, there's a shot in it, which is like seven minutes or six minutes long. There's a couple of them, but there's one shot that just, it just did it for me. It's, it's a really impactful film. It shows minimalism and mastery of camera movement. I love the acting. It's a brilliant story. It's so contained. It's so perfect. It's a really good film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when I uh, say these words, what comes to your mind? Honesty. Angelica. Struggle. 
me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, no, actually, no, I'm not kidding. It's me. Yeah. Are you sure? You can I'm change your answer. I'm in a constant struggle with change, myself. Change it, change it, change it, change it. No, no, it's, it's fine. I think of myself. When I think struggle, I think myself. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Inspiration. Um, Angelica. Yeah. Achievement for you is? Achievement for me? Don't make that face. I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know what an achievement. I don't know what an achievement is. It's not money. That's for sure. It's not money. It's um, what is it? Peace. What is the achievement for Robert? Peace. peace. Yeah. Relations. Relations. What do I think of when I when I hear the word relations? Yeah. Family. Friends. High school. Mm -hmm. Would you like to share something from that high school era? Um, a yeah. naughty act. A naughty act. Something, something that I did in high school that was naughty. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So in grade 10, I skipped 85 math classes out of 89. Yes. There were 89 classes. I skipped 85 of them. I slept through three of them. I was fully awake in one. I just, in my head, I was like, you know what? This is the one class that I don't care you about. You slept this year. also? Yeah. And um, I ended up with 5% grade in that class. My reason for skipping was very simple. I was dating someone at the time and she had a spare during that time. So I would always skip and go to her place and skip school. So it was the last class of the, of the, of the day. So I would just go with her, you know, <clears throat> it made sense in my head. So new relationships, right? When you're 15, you just, you're thinking just about the relationship. So when my report card came out, I, I gotta be honest, I wasn't expecting 5%, right? I, I thought if I just attend the tests, Mm -hmm. But apparently I had missed a whole bunch of tests and I didn't even know it. So I got 5% and uh, I didn't know how I was going to tell my mom. <laughs> so I photoshopped an, a nine in front of the five and got 95%, but I didn't change the comments that he had written. So I had 95% and the, and the, and the comment was, Robert should consider work level destination courses. The, 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 what that means here is that you're yeah. taking university pathway and you're so stupid that you actually need to downgrade yourself to college level or work level, workplace level, elemental math, applied math, not academic math. My mom's like, what does this mean? And I'm like, <laughs> I Something I, mom, I just leave it. Yeah, I, no, no, no. I, I came up with a no, 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 no. I came up with a brilliant story. I was like, I they're saying that I'm so smart that I should just skip the rest of high school and go straight to work. Workplace level destination courses. So that's yeah. smart. Very smart. It's 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 not a bad lie. It's not the worst one I ever ever came up with. So yeah, that was that was pretty good. So after that, also your mom never had come to know about this, right? Never. I told her. I told her the next year Confess. because she saw that I was I was having to redo grade ten math. I had to redo it. Obviously, I failed, so I had to redo it. Right. So she was like, "What the hell? Why are you in grade ten math again?" I was like, "Yeah, you know that ninety five last year was really a five. I failed." I but the time was over, so she was exactly. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Smart kid. Life. Life. Uh, I think of a fetus. Like a baby. Yeah. Relaxation. Me on a beach. Even though I don't like beaches. Then why beach? I don't know. I just imagine myself in the shade at a beach, secluded, no people, just me. Maybe that's why I don't like beaches because there's too many people. So me, private beach, in the shade, no sun, cloudy. <laughs> okay. Sound good. <laughs> Oh, with nobody. 
with nobody. Or with a partner? No, with myself. Just you? Just me. Greater ideas of writing a story then. Okay, mm. so Oscars. <sighs> Overrated. Theater. No way. Theater, like theater acting, like theater, theater, or movie theater? Theater, theater, acting, theater. Actors. Right. Dreams. Sundance. 